Welcome to our 11 o'clock service here at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of Faith Dialogue. Today, uh, we are continuing, we're in week two of a brand new series. It's the series on the Gospel of Matthew. You know, as we start off, I want to I want to uh, mention that, you know, last week we only did one verse, uh, but this week we we're going to be going through verse 17, uh, Matthew 1, 2 through 17. And um, last week, our, our, the uh, title of our message was Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Today, our title is similar. It's Joseph the husband of Mary, just Joseph, the husband of Mary. And you'll see how that, uh, that unique phrase, unique phrase is so different, so unlike any other genealogies and so unlike the rest of the uh, generations leading up to Jesus. And Matthew had a very specific reason in calling um, Joseph the husband of Mary. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this genealogy. There's a lot of names in there. We want to try to take it, uh, get through all of the different names. There's going to be 42 different generations leading up to Jesus. So let me get started. Matthew chapter 1, verses uh, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amimadad, Amimadad begot Nation, and Nation begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by, who, by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Of course, that's speaking of Bathsheba. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. And Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Amon. And Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Zechariah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Verse 12, and after they were brought to Babylon, Zechariah begot Seliatel, Seliatel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abuad, Abuad begot Elikam, Elikam begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, Achim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Wow, that's a, that's a huge genealogy. Uh, this word in verse 1, by the way, that's uh, translated as genealogy, and that's a, that's a really good translation, um, it is actually uh, the word generations. Generations. You know, and it's unfortunate. All too often, we, uh, we today don't really understand what a genealogy is. And I think that has a lot to do with what we see on TV, with CSI, with some of our crime shows. Uh, we're told about genes, and most people today are familiar with genes and DNA. And we get, you know, this word gene comes from the word genealogy. And people get confused because actually, a genealogy table is a generations table and includes it includes also the adopted sons and daughters which are fully a part of the generations you know it's unfortunate sometimes when an adopted son or daughter doesn't feel like they fit into the family tree but that's not true often the adopted son and daughter is just as much a part and they should be a part of the family tree just as any other member and entitled to all of the same, the same benefits and the same respect. They've been grafted in. And that's important for us to remember because we remember as believers in Jesus Christ that our Gentiles have been grafted in. We've been adopted as sons and daughters of Abraham because the blessings of Abraham have been extended to those Christians uh, that, are, that are Gentiles, that are not Jewish, that have been grafted in because of a belief in, in Jesus Christ. 
Um, so, so happily, uh, our, our gener uh, sometimes genealogy is a little bit easier today because of, because of DNA. Uh, some people are actually finding their, their, uh, their birth mothers and birth fathers, which is kind of a, a completely different story and really not what the, the idea of generations here. Uh, but but it, is, it can be kind of fun. I don't know whether you've uh, tied into uh, to Ancestry.com or any of the other sites. My, my brother Dave and I uh, share a, uh, an account on, on Ancestry.com. And it's been kind of fun looking at our uh, genealogy, looking at our ancestors going back uh, as far as we possibly can. And that it's very time consuming, so you have to be a little careful because it can also be a great time waster. Uh, but what we found is what we kind of knew is that our family was, was kind of a dud. Um, there's, there's no princes, there's no kings, there's no royalty, no castles, uh, no, no real uh, ancestry uh, of note on either, either side, my mom's side or my dad's side. Uh, but just to give you an example, here's a, here's a picture of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, only relative back in the 1800s that we actually have a picture of. Uh, this is Michael Renault, or Rhino. It's my great, great, great grandfather who was born in Quebec. Uh, he was French Canadian. And we know that uh, we're part of that family tree because we know that his children moved, uh, they were born in Canada, but they moved to Michigan. And we know we pick up our, 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 our tree in Michigan because we're from Michigan. My grandmother was born in Marquette, Michigan in the late 19th century. And Michigan was where our children were born. And it continues to be our, our home away from home. So, so enough of, of my answer history. Let's get into what, what Matthew's talking about here in this genealogy of Jesus Christ. And you know, it's interesting because some scholars have said that Matthew uh, takes a look at the genealogy and really the life of Christ from a Jewish perspective. And, and Luke, who has the other genealogy, uh, takes a look at the life of Christ from a Gentile perspective. Uh, but at looking at it and, and preparing for this lesson and the rest of this series, I can tell you that Matthew actually is looking at this from Jesus Christ, the Messiah's perspective. And really, we start off right away in, in these verses talking about Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God. That's who Matthew is referring to here. Um, so as we talk a lot about uh, these, this genealogy to do, this generations, the 14, 14, and 14, 42 different individuals that are part of the ancestry of Jesus Christ going back to, to Abraham, uh, there's three points we're going to make. And the first point is that we have a plan unveiled. Uh, the second is that there's a provision, that's the provision of God that has echoed. And the third is that we'll see prophecy fulfilled. So let's begin today with the plan unveiled. Now, this of course is God's plan, and we see it from the very, very beginning, and we picked it up last week in verse number one, where, where uh, Matthew recorded, he said, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And, and here's one of the reasons I went, I went back and picked up this one verse that we, we spent the entire uh, half hour on last week, is because we don't wanna miss the magnificent claim that Matthew makes. Matthew is claiming messiahship for Jesus. He does this by calling him the Christ, which is the Greek title of the, of the word Messiah. Uh, Messiah is uh, Hebrew, but Christ, the anointed one, is, is, the, is the Greek title for Jesus. That's how we have the title Jesus Christ or Jesus the Christ. And this is the plan unveiled. God made a covenant a long time ago with Abraham and this was the covenant that it was planned. Uh, this was the plan and it was going to be revealed in Jesus Christ. So for example, the prophet Samuel, as David was, a, was an old man, and as he had been king for a number of years, came to David and this is what he said. He said, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I want you to notice some of, some of these aspects of God's promise to David. Uh, this eternal king that would come would be a direct descendant of King David. Uh, and this eternal kingdom will not be David's doing. This will be established by God. In verse 13 it says, an I, meaning God, will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 
Last week, we looked at some of the implications of being the son of Abraham. I mentioned how Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. And here in Matthew wants us to see he is that he is the son of Abraham that will in fact be of the promise of, of Isaac's line. Verse 2 says, And Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. That's the generations preceding Jesus Christ. Matthew makes this claim that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And, and this is the plan unveiled. It includes all of these ancestors of Jesus. Matthew reveals the generations from uh, Abraham to David, and then David to the deportation. He makes it very clear that these are uh, different segments of time, but this is all part of God's, God's revealed plan. Now let's go on to point two. Point two is the provisions that are echoed. Uh, these provisions that are echoed, I'm gonna focus on three women in the Bible, three women that Matthew mentions. And actually it's quite unusual for Matthew to, uh, to, uh, to name women because that typically wasn't done in genealogies. We're gonna talk about Tamar in verse three and then Rahab and Ruth and they're both in, in verse five. You know, in writing a genealogy, a history of these generations, Matthew went out of his way to include these three, these three female ancestors of Jesus. Um, Matthew deems them essential to truly understand um, how God is unveiling this, this plan, echoing the, the plan throughout the generations. So let's take a look at it. The first one is, is Tamar. Verse 3 reads, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That's Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now the story of Tamar is in Genesis 38. And perhaps you, you've read it, perhaps you've, you've, uh, you remember from it. And uh, because this is church, I'm going to clean it up a little. Uh, the version in the Bible in, verse, in chapter 38 of Genesis is, is definitely PG. It's, it's meant for uh, somewhat mature audiences. So you can read that at home uh, as you like. So let me just uh, go through the story of Tamar a little bit. Now, Judah had a son. His oldest son was named Er, E-R. Now, I don't know why anybody would name their son Er, but that was, that was Judah's firstborn son was Er. And Er married uh, uh, an Israelite woman uh, named Tamar, named Tamar. And Er died. In fact, the Bible says that he was evil in the sight of the Lord and he died. In Israel, the duty of the brother was to marry the, marry the widow and father the children for his older brother or younger brother in that case, whatever the case was, uh, so that the generations would continue, so that the, the son would be able to have a, uh, a progeny, uh, to have a son or a daughter. And, and that fell to Onan. Onan was uh, Judah's second son. And Onan did not want, he took Tamar as his wife, but, but he refused to have children with her. He didn't want to have children with her. And again, this was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Onan was killed as well. So now here Judah has one left, one son. His, his, his son is Shelah. His, his, his third son is Shelah. And he's, he's concerned about Tamar being married to Shelah because he sees what's happened to the two older brothers. And this is what Judah says. It's recorded in Genesis 38. It says, remain a widow. This is, this is Judah talking to Tamar. Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. I am afraid that he too may die like his brothers. Well, Shelah came of age and realized, uh, and Tamar realized that uh, he was ne she was never going to be married to Shelah. She would never be able to, to fulfill what was uh, given to her uh, by law in Israel. So Tamar decides to take it upon herself to be able to get back into the family. So what she does, and again, I told you this was a PG version, was that Tamar dressed up as a prostitute and waited for Judah to come into the, to the city. So as Judah walked by, she was a prostitute and uh, uh, caught Judah's eye, and Judah slept with her. Well, Judah must have forgotten his wallet, his America Express at home, because he didn't have any way to pay her. So he gave her his staff as well as his signet. Uh, his signet is like a ring that's, that's used to sign official documents. Uh, that way she would hold it until he would come back and be able to pay. Well, he went back the next day, but he, he couldn't find her. Nobody knew of this, this prostitute because she wasn't a prostitute. It was, it was Tamar. 
So, so as time goes on, Tamar, of course, is, is pregnant and Judah finds out about it. And he's going to discipline her. He says that Tamar has been playing the harlot, okay? So he's going to discipline her. But Tamar shows up at Judah's house and she's got his, his staff as well as his signet. And, and Judah realizes that he, he was the one that was in the wrong, that, that Tamar was supposed to be given to one of the sons, one of, one of, one of Judah's sons, but, but he failed to do that. And this is what he says. He says, she, referring to Tamar, is more righteous than I, inasmuch as I did not give her to my son, Shelah. And this is the way that Tamar is included in this genealogy. Tamar with Judah and the father gave birth to twin sons named Perez and Zerah. And that was why they're included in Matthew 3. This is the ancestry of Jesus Christ. So let's go on. Let's turn to the story of Rahab. And that's also mentioned in, in verse 5. And now many of you are familiar with, uh, with the story of Rahab. Now interestingly, again this is a PG version today, is that Rahab was known as the harlot. Rahab the harlot. She was a Canaanite woman living in Jericho. And when Joshua and the tribes of Israel came to Jericho and were ready to take it, uh, Joshua sent spies into Jericho, two spies. And the two spies uh, were hidden by Rahab up in her, on her roof. And when the soldiers came looking for these two Israelite spies, Rahab, a Canaanite woman, um, basically told the soldiers, she said, um, I saw them go out through the, through the front gate just before it got dark. Go pursue the two Israelites and perhaps you'll, you'll, you'll catch up with them. Uh, the spies, of course, were, were not found because they were still with Rahab. And the spies were interested on in why Rahab went out of her way to betray her own people and basically protect these two Israelite spies. And this is what, and this is what it says in Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. Um, Rahab says this, she says, For the Lord your God is God in heaven above, above and the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. So when the city of Jericho fell, and you know the story very well, when the city of Jericho fell, Rahab and her whole family were spared. And Rahab married one of the Israelites and became uh, one of the generations leading to King David. Now the last woman that will be used today, uh, that, that we'll talk about today, that was included by Matthew in these generations, this genealogy leading up to Jesus, was Ruth. Now, now Ruth is so famous that she has her own book in the Bible. I told you in my family, uh, nobody, had, nobody of note was in there. We don't have anybody in the, in, the, in the World Book Encyclopedia. Nobody that I could find on the internet of note. Um, but Ruth, this, this Israelite, uh, has her, this, 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 this part of the generations of Jesus Christ, uh, has her own book in the Bible. Uh, the book of Ruth, Ruth documents how, how Naomi, a Hebrew, was living in the land of Moab when her husband and her two sons died. Uh, well, after her sons died, Naomi went to her daughters-in-law that were there, and she said, return back to, the, to, the, to your parents' house and find husbands there. But Naomi, but, but, but Ruth, one of her daughters-in-law said, no, he, she said, your God will be my God, your people my people, and where you go, I will go. So Ruth and Naomi travel back to, of all places, Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem is where uh, King David is going to be born and where Jesus is going to be born, according to prophecies. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So she goes back to, to Bethlehem and they meet a, a, a kinsman redeemer. And that kinsman redeemer is named Boaz. And Boaz ends up marrying Ruth and they have a, ch they have a, a, a child. And this is what it says. It says that Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. So we see these generations. So this, this provision of God through these three women ended up with David born in, in Bethlehem, King David. So we see that these three women are all echoing God's provision. So let's get to the third point, which is prophecy fulfilled. There are 42 different names listed in these generations prior to Jesus Christ. A long list of names. You know, and unfortunately, uh, we, we often, when we see these begots, 
um, we kind of go on to the next chapter. We see when they're done. And we see that in Genesis and a few other places in the Bible. We, we kind of go to the end rather than reading all the names. But if we do that, we miss some of the language that, these, that, these, uh, that the Bible is using. Because, because when it comes to Joseph, Joseph, Joseph did not begot Jesus. It said that Joseph was the husband of Mary. And that language changes, and, it's, and it's, it, kind of, it kind of jumps off on the page to you that, that Matthew's going out of his way to basically say, no, Joseph was the husband of Mary, but Mary was the mother of Jesus, the, the Christ. And, and, you know, Joseph was the human father of Jesus. Uh, this, the prophet Isaiah, some 750 years before Jesus was born, said this. He said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Uh, Matthew's account not only illustrates how this prophecy was fulfilled, but it highlights all three points that I'm talking about today. The, the God's plan that was unveiled, it was echoed in, the, in these three women, uh, but especially now in, in Joseph being the husband uh, of Mary. And this is a prophecy that is fulfilled. Now, the Gospel of Luke fulfills in the backstory of what Matthew is referring to here. Joseph, the husband of Mary, he was not the father of Jesus. And that's clearly illustrated in the Gospel of Luke. And as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, from time to time, we'll pull in one of the other Gospels to give us the backstory, to give us some, some, some of the things that Matthew is, is missing in his Gospel. So in, in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, we read this in uh, chapter 2, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, this passage from, from Luke, along with these simple words of Jesus, Joseph, the husband of Mary, provides the story, the fulfillment of a prophecy that was given by, the, uh, by Isaiah over 750 years prior to that. The scriptures today will, will il these illustrate exactly how God's plan is unveiled and how it's fulfilled and how prophecy is fulfilled in these generations leading up to Jesus Christ. You know, it's very important for Matthew to identify Jesus as a son of David, of, of, the, of this royal line, because if the Jews, the opponents of Jesus, could prove that Jesus wasn't born of the, the line of David, it would disqualify Jesus as the Messiah. But Jesus was the Messiah. He is fully God and fully man through this act uh, that the Lord did by making Joseph the husband of Mary, but the father of Jesus is actually the Holy Spirit. Now, let's, let's finish up with these, these four teens that's, that's given in the very last verse, well, where, where it says there's four, 14 generations before the Babylonian captivity, before David, uh, 14 generations from David to the Babylonian captivity, and then 14 generations after the, after the captivity. And, and what does that refer to? Well, in most study Bibles, it's, it's understood that, that in numerology, now this is a subject that I don't spend a lot of time at, but in, in the Hebrew language, in many other languages, every single word, every single letter has a, has a numeric value. And it comes from the word itself. 
So in, in Hebrew, uh, the word David, David is three letters. Remember in the Hebrew, they don't use vowels, they only use consonants. So it's D, V, D, or Deled, Vod, Deled. Okay, Deled is the fourth letter of the Hebrew um, uh, alphabet. Uh, Vav is the, uh, is the sixth letter, and then Deved, again, is the sixth letter, so uh, the fourth letter. So four plus six plus four is 14. So David, the number of David, the numerical value of the name David, as in King David, is 14. And Matthew is, is using this to illustrate that this is all part of, of God's plan. It, it's 14, 14, and 14, so it's, 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 it's used three times. So we have these numbers, and the question is, what, is, what does this number 14 mean? Well, this is the only place in the Bible that, that it's referenced, 14, uh, the only place that it's referenced. So scholars are kind of scratching their head trying to understand exactly what this, this 14 means. We know that it's associated with David, and the number David is, is, is the, the, the numerical value of the word David is seven. So scholars say, well, it's, it's, it's seven twice. It's seven twice. Well, again, in prophecy fulfilled, if the, if, the, if the son of David, the Messiah, is David twice, it may indicate that Jesus Christ is actually coming twice. You see, this was a, this was a, a mystery to the people of Israel. They knew that the Messiah was coming and that he would be the king, that he would, they would, they would assume the throne of David forever. But we know now through history, 2,000 years later, that Jesus first came as the suffering servant to die on a cross for our sins. But after that, he would rise again and we would be grafted in as Gentiles and we would be able to have all of the rights and the privileges, all of the blessings um, through Jesus that was promised to uh, the, the children of, of Abraham. But Jesus Christ is coming back again. The make, Bible makes that, that very, very clear that Jesus is coming back again. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back to put an end to sin and to be able to rule then on the throne of, of David in Israel. So 14 is seven twice, and this is where it all fits in as prophecy unveiled. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this, this day. We thank you, Lord.